Good afternoon, everyone, or morning, wherever, whatever time it is that you happen to tune into this. But it's good to be with you today. I'm Tim Bell. Uh, I uh, am from Northside Baptist Church, and I have a weekly Bible study for anybody who is interested in hearing more about God's Word. We are talking today about John chapter 15, and that's a very familiar set of verses that almost everybody knows. They, you may not know them by heart, but you know of them. And most of you would know that's where they're found, but when I read them, they'll sound very familiar to you. Before we get started, though, let me just say that we have uh, individuals on our prayer list and different people who you may know that we want to lift up in prayer, different circumstances and situations. Uh, today just so happens is when we pass the half a million mark of deaths of COVID. So we need to remember those families in our prayers and, and many others that have this kind of type of sickness or that type of sickness. So uh, we, we need to know, I hope you know that God understands and that he wants to help you through those situations. Even if you're not healed from them necessarily, he's there to heal you spiritually and to give you the um, spiritual discernment that you need and the uh, mental grasp to know that God is with you and he'll give you the power and strength to get through it one way or the other. Uh, so we would need to remember these things in prayer. So let's, let's go together to our Lord. Thank you, Lord, for caring about us and for loving us. Thank you, Father, for teaching us, for giving us your holy word. Thank you, Lord, that it's truths live in our lives because of your spirit. And the truths that live in our lives are those that help us to be a better Christian or to hear God's voice, the Holy Spirit's voice in our lives, to accept the call to be a Christian. So I pray, Father, that you would allow people to hear and to act and to obey. Lead us now together in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, verse 1 of John chapter 15 Jesus is talking, and he is saying, I'm the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. As we begin this particular part, you notice the imagery that's used. This is a New Testament imagery that was used many times when God was equating his people with the vineyards. And he would always talk about the fact that the vineyards are there. They're supposed to be healthy. They're supposed to bring about fruit. They're supposed to be useful. But people forget their purpose. They sin against God. And because of that, the vineyards dry up. It's not because God dries them up. It's because the people dry them up because they no longer adhere to God's word. And so we have Jesus bringing this imagery forthright in the New Testament in John chapter 15. Uh, let, let, me, let me read the second set of scriptures that we're going to look at tonight because they kind of tie in together. Remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. Looking at our illustration that shows about the vine and the vineyard and the branches and the grapes, we see here it says that God is the gardener. The um, King James, I think, calls him the husbandman, but God is the gardener. He's the one who takes care of the soil, and he's the one that provides the soil, and he's the one that tends it, plants it, takes care of it. And so uh, the, this, uh, the, the vine is in God's hands, and he puts uh, in charge of the vine is Jesus. Jesus, of course, is, is a, a person of the Trinity, and so Jesus uh, is the Son of God. And so he is the way that God is going to nourish the world by using the nurturing, uh, miraculous powers uh, and servanthood and love of Jesus Christ, who is divine. Uh, now, we, we are the branches. So you can see that uh, divine, the big part, that's Jesus. We're the branches. We're the branches. Now, if we're doing what God wants us to do, 
and fulfilling his purpose, we bear grapes. Okay, there you go, we bear grapes. But we don't always bear grapes because sometimes a vine comes up like this and there's no fruit on it. And for one reason or another, that can happen. If you have grown tomatoes or other kinds of vegetables at times, you'll notice that maybe everything looks really great on a plant, but then all of a sudden there's a part of it that's all withered. And it could be because of bugs or it could be because of just the nature of the plant that it wasn't a, a healthy plant. Uh, or there could be a number of reasons for it. It may be, you may have tied it too tightly and cut off the circulation of the branch or whatever it may be. And so this is the idea that Jesus is bringing to his people. He's saying, God has given to you me the vine. And because I'm a healthy vine, branches have sprouted from that vine. And some branches have fruit and some don't. And the ones that don't are pruned and cut off so that these that are healthy will bear more fruit the next year. You know how that is when you prune something. It's kind of, you, you kind of hate to do that sometimes. You may have something that even looks healthy, but you have to prune it. Like when you sucker a tomato plant, it's, you know, that sucker you pull off looks very healthy. It's coming out right in between, of course, two branches, but it's real green and healthy uh, and everything. But you know, all it's going to do is not bear fruit and it's going to sap the power from the other part of the plant. And so we, we snap it off and we don't use that part. We get rid of it. And that's kind of a painful thing to do sometimes when something looks so healthy like that. And yet, and yet um, God prunes his vine. God prunes, prunes the branches for people who are not doing the work that God has called them to do because they just get in the way. You know, they just, they, they are a hindrance to the overall value of the vine and the overall value of the fruit. And so we get rid of them so that others can grow even more. Now, exactly when that occurs, you know, in a church, you know, uh, that's up to conjecture. Sometimes people think that if somebody is sitting or, or doing this or that, uh, then, then, you know, you're supposed to go and prune them and tell them to get lost. And the early churches did that. You know, they were very uh, quick on going up to people who they didn't think were following the law and following, you know, a sinless life. They were very quick to go to those people and expel them from the church because they wanted the, the vines, the grapes that were left to be healthier. The problem with that is that what Jesus said, whoever is without sin, let him cast the first stone. So there really wasn't anybody good enough to even make those decisions. And yet God, uh, you know, in his infinite wisdom and his infinite goodness, provided the Holy Spirit to help us to reform and to change our lives. Uh, so, so you know, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of playing God sometimes when we think that we have the ability or that we have the, um, uh, what would I say, the, 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 the power or we have the right to go and expel people and tell them where they're falling short. Now, now there, there are times like that, that we do do that. Uh, I guess whenever there's, you know, a situation that can hurt the church. So anyway, that's, you know, kind of, kind of where we're at. Um, I've also written a few things here because people get the ideas of what exactly Jesus was talking about. And there are different interpretations of this. And here basically are the interpretations. One says that the bare branches are those who heard the gospel and do not respond. They're the ones, that's who Jesus is talking about. Those that have heard the gospel, just like these other branches, but they responded. And because they responded, they bring new members into the flock because they, they you know, they tell them about the Holy Spirit and the saving grace, the saving power. And so grapes are formed. Uh, uh, you know, uh, others, um, you know, are Christians and they do good works and the fruits of their spirits, the fruits of their works, the fruits of their um, uh, Christian character, peace, and, and you know, and, and, and all, all of those um, fruits, they are evident that they are Christians. And so their fruits, you know, are evident as in this poster. So, so some people say that that's what that means. Others say the bare branches are those who lost faith. So they were at one time Christians and they had a bunch of fruit, 
but they lost faith and so they lost their fruit. And the next year when the vine grew, there was no fruit there because they had lost their faith and given up. So that's another viewpoint. Another viewpoint is that branches are all mankind, not only the Christians. Branches are all mankind, not only the Christians, and therefore those who accept Jesus Christ bear fruit, and those that don't are barren. And then some kind of go back to the Old Testament idea that the bare branches are those who rejected Christ. You know, Jesus talked about uh, Jewish, uh, you know, the Pharisees, etc., and that the ones that didn't accept him. In fact, he said, I've come for the Jews because you were prepared, you know, you through your Old Testament theology and ideas and worship, you knew that there was somebody else coming, that God was going to send somebody who was going to save you, and it's me. And you should be able to accept that. The trouble is the Jews were looking for a different kind of savior, a powerful savior that would come and kill with the sword, not, not a, a meek servant type savior like Jesus Christ. And so it is that people look at these various ways in which to come about what exactly to do the bare branches stand for. Uh, so now it just kind of depends on where you're at, what camp you're in, what denomination you're in. You know, you may feel like people can lose their salvation. And if you do, then you'll probably go along with the second one. The bare branches are those who lost their faith. Uh, you know, they were fruitful. They had all this going for them. And then all of a sudden, you know, they, they, they lost their faith. Now, the um, the analogy here doesn't say that the vine that bears fruit bore it one year and then didn't the next. It just says it never did bear fruit. You know, these are the ones that never did bear fruit. So it seems to indicate that those are the ones that maybe heard the word of God but never responded. And that's that's the way that I interpret that. I look at it as those being the ones who... You know, with God's love and seeing the Holy Spirit and seeing uh, Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us and to show us what salvation was all about. But to me, and more importantly, to show us God's love and to follow God in his love and in his mercy and goodness. But but we failed to do that and we wanted to do our own thing. And so a lot of people did and those people never became Christian. So to me, you know, those are the branches on the vine. But then some say because Jesus is the vine and they're actually growing on the vine, they would have had to have some kind of um, an established relationship with Christ. Otherwise, this, this you know, they wouldn't even grow at all. And that's one way to look at it, you know, and, and you can say, yes, that, that is what that means. And that these people here who maybe be, were Christians lost their faith or whatever. And so they became withered up and they died. And it really doesn't matter which which uh, theory you, you believe, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I talked to some people who thought that they could fall from grace and lose their salvation. And I said, do you think you can lose your salvation? He said, no, we don't think we can, but we think that other people can. So usually people who who say that, that they can lose their faith or that some people can lose their faith, they really don't think they themselves can because they have experienced the love of God and experienced the nurturing uh, love and care and concern of their creator. And so they find it hard, impossible really for them to turn and, and walk away. Uh, but but like I say, they think that other people can, even though they can't. So, um, you know, you can, like I say, you can argue that point day in and day out. And it's really not that important, rather or not, I think, um, you, know, you, know, you know, mentally, rather or not, I think that I can lose my salvation. So I could say right now, yes, I believe I could probably lose my salvation if I did some dastardly things or if I rejected Jesus Christ or the Bible says if I blasphemed the Holy Spirit and rejected Jesus that you know maybe you know maybe I could lose my faith well okay you, you know maybe you know you know I don't know I, I don't think I can I, you know I'm, I'm not in that category I think that's where most people come from so instead of arguing that point it's it, it's really you know kind of a minor point you know to me when you become a Christian you are a Christian and because if you really uh, taste of the love of God and really walk in his ways and feel the power that he gives to you, you're not going to reject that. I mean, once you get it, you're not going to reject it. You know, if you uh, get, you know, in physically speaking, if, 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 if you, uh, 
you, you know, had the option of having, you know, a, a real nice home or, or living in, in a shack or have plenty of money or have not much money, um, you know, and you struggle every day, you don't know if you're going to have enough food to live on. Uh, most people are going to say, well, I would rather just live in America because I don't want to give up my life rather than move to an impoverished nation and have to struggle all day long. So why would anybody who feels the love and feels the power of Jesus Christ walking in your life uh, and totally changes your life in a spiritual sense, why would you want to give that up? Why would you want to say, well, that's really not for me anymore. And even though you've been great to me, Father, and, and Jesus, you've been loving to me and helped me, I'm just ready to give it up. I mean, that that just doesn't make sense. And people, it really, you know, they're not going to do that. So I think this, this that, that whole argument is just kind of a theoretical argument anyway. And, and um, you know, but, but then, you know, you look around and you see people who seem to be, um, walking close to the spirit, and then all of a sudden they they do their own thing. You know, we call them, we say they're in a backslidden condition, which means they're a Christian. They're just not living close to the Lord. Uh, and I guess that's possible, you know, but I don't know. Somebody who's backslidden and not walking in the fullness of Jesus Christ and not, and not uh, accepting the fact that they're Christians and people cannot see Christ in their life, I would say you need, I would say you need to reexamine your relationship with Jesus Christ. You may not be a Christian. You may have thought you were, but you really weren't. So anyway, that that's neither here nor there. Uh, but but it is an important aspect of what we're talking about here and the different, as far as I'm concerned, the different theories that I've heard, at least that people say that the vine refers to. Now, the, um, uh, let's see. I was going to tell you something else, but I really don't want to get into it. So I'm going to stop at that part right there. And we're going to move on to chapter, um, I'm sorry, the same chapter. We're, but we're going to go into verse uh, 6 and 8. Because I think this is more of a practical application to what we're talking about. Jesus goes on to say, and this is kind of the point of, of, of what he's coming to. If you, do, if you do not remain in me... You are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. See, now there again, if you do those that do not remain in me, see, that seems to indicate the fact that people were within him, but then have have given that part up or have fallen from that. And and here again, you can you can adopt that that idea if you want to. If you look at uh, you know all the scriptures, uh, it seems to indicate eternal security. But uh, there are some that that you, you know don't always point in that same direction so it's just kind of up to you with the help of the spirit just let him guide you and even if you come to the conclusion that you can lose your salvation um don't don't plan on that because if you're a christian i don't really think you're going to uh, you're 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 going to continue to live the a christ-like life if you really were a christian because nobody's going to want to give that up like say that's that's silly to 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 leave a um, uh, a um, what would I say a rich lifestyle where you have about anything that you want not just need but want and go and give it all up and go live in poverty now some people have done that Francis St. Francis did that so some people do do that but in general you're not going to give up something good that you have uh, much less give up somebody who you can walk, who gives you confidence and, and you can follow in a spiritual sense, you're not going to give that up. Okay, well, in, in, anyway, uh, uh, so just make your own decision on that. You know, it's it's uh, it's important. I think where you come down on that as far as how it affects your life uh, and the strength that you receive from it. I mean, knowing that God can not only save you, but he can keep you. That's a pretty powerful statement. And that's the one I've always held on to. Um, it says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Okay, now that's uh, that, that verse, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now, some people take that as just ask whatever you want. If you have enough faith, God's going to give it to you. There was a, a young man in, in my um, church, and he had cancer. And it was actually, it, 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 it started, um, you know, this pancreas and what have you, and it spread. And there was really no hope at this point. He was in his bed, and he knew he, he wasn't going to live, and he was making arrangements. And then some a minister came in who was a friend of a friend, 
and he came in and uh, I wasn't there at the time, but his wife said he came in and said that if you have enough faith, uh, Bob, that's the guy's name. He said, Bob, if you have enough faith, you can get up and walk anytime you want to. You can get rid of this disease. All you have to do is have enough faith. He says, he used these scriptures, you know, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Okay, uh, so so his mother, uh, Bob, Bob was married, but his mother lived with him. His mother accepted what that minister said. And so she fasted and and she really believed that God was going to heal him from uh, terminal cancer, that he was within a week of dying or, or just a few days. I mean, he was you know, just, you could tell he was very depleted. He wasn't going to last much longer. And so his wife, you know, was kind of, uh, his wife told me about what he said. And I said, you don't really believe that, do you? And she said, no. And I said, well, that's good that you don't, because God does not promise that he's going to keep us from dying in a physical sense. God does not promise that. And if you would be praying like you should, if we pray like we should, we find out that when we pray for those who are sick and what have you, that that's a good thing and they may or may not get better. The point is, it's, 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 I know from our mortal standpoint looking at it, it's important that they do get better and it is. But if they don't, God has seen them through it. God has taken care of it. There was this lady that I knew, and her name was Mrs. Pritchett, and she was almost 100, and I went to visit her because she was a member of a church that I used to attend when I was a lot younger. And she said that she was real sick and all, and she was dying, and she got better. And she got mad at the church people because she said she wanted to be with her husband. She had seen him for 20 years, and she didn't want to get better. And she said, so I got on him. I told him, I don't want you praying that I get better. Just pray that you know, my, my life while it's here is comfortable I'm going through the death process as comfortable as can be and that I have the courage and I'm not going to fear death because I know that you're with me. Now, that's that's what prayer is for. And if you abide in him, that's what you know. If you abide in Jesus, you know that he's going to go with you. You know when you die, you're going to go to heaven. And you know that even though it's kind of a scary proposition sometime, I mean, I know people say, well, I'm ready to go and and uh, I'm not afraid of it or anything like that. And that's that's great. But, but uh, I would still think that almost in every case, there is some apprehension to kind of know what it's going to be like. Whenever I go on a roller coaster or something, you know, I, I used to go on them. I can't do it anymore because of my heart, but I used to go on roller coasters all the time. The bigger and the meaner, the better. Uh, and, and I was, uh, before I got on the car, you know, I was, I was, fr you know, I was, uh, I had a lot of anxiety. I thought, How, what's, how's, how's this going to do? It's going to go off the tracks. Is it, you know, what's going to happen? But that was all part of it. And so I'd get on there, you know, and off I'd go. And to me, dying is kind of the same thing. You know, it's not like a roller coaster in that sense, but it's kind of like, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how many curves there's going to be or how many turns there's going to be, how fast I'm going to go. I don't know what all this is going to be about, but I'm going to put my hand in God's hand because I know everybody dies and he did not promise me eternal physical life. And sickness comes and God doesn't call sickness. He doesn't want sickness. He hates sickness, but sickness came into our lives and diminishes us. You know, the, the Old Testament in the Garden of Eden, and seems to indicate that people live forever. It was sin that cut their life short. And so because of our sinful natures, um, you know, we just don't live forever. We're just not built to live forever. That's just the way it is. And when we die, we, you know, that's, the, you know, we, we, we leave our uh, old natures, you know, totally behind. And in our new natures, we are with God forever. Um, so, so that that's what Jesus is saying. So, so if you, if you remain in me, then you know what to pray for. Now, there have been instances that you don't know how to pray, right? Things have happened. You don't really know how to pray. You, you, you don't know um, enough facts. You don't have enough facts to know, uh, you know what, what you should pray for. That's okay because we don't need to know how to pray exactly, uh, specifically for those situations anyway. What we do is, is we just ask God's guidance when we pray for an individual that God will put his hand of comfort in that person's life and that he will walk with him and that the person will see the light of God and feel his comfort and his peace and that he gives and grants peace to us who, are, who remain behind. 
uh, you know, it's it's not the you know, you know, Lord, you know, whatever. I mean, my father-in-law had Alzheimer's and he was um, lingering for weeks and weeks, you know, and finally he got to where he couldn't get out of bed because his health had gone down little by little by little. He didn't know where he was or anything else. Uh, and, and so my prayer wasn't let him live longer. That That's cruel. You know, we don't, that's, that's us that want him to live longer. We don't want that. We want him to, to, to be with our father in heaven. And not to fool around with all this uh, earthly uh, sickness and pain. And when he died, it was a blessing. It was a blessing because we know that he's in a better place. And he's with God. And he doesn't suffer anymore. And so in our own lives, we look to this and we say, So Lord, what is it that you want us to do? How should we pray? How do you want us to pray? Sometimes we don't know, so we just pray. In the political world, you know, you may say, uh, you know, exactly what angle should I come at? You know, you know, how should I pray about this? Should I pray that we leave Afghanistan or stay in Afghanistan? You know, should I pray that we make this decision or that decision? But, you know, I, I, I don't have the, uh, the, 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 the knowledge or the reports to know to make a decent decision that would make much sense. But that doesn't matter. I can still pray for the Afghan people. And for the people who are making decisions in, you know, concerning that situation, I don't have to know and understand all of it. I just know that it's a war that's been going on forever and that I pray for those people who are suffering, the mothers who have little babies that are starving or even died, the, you know, people who've lost their homes, you know, you know, I don't, I don't really know exactly what's the best situation. I mean, we don't want anybody to lose their homes and what have you, but exactly how to go about it. So I just leave that, I just put that in God's hands. I say, Lord, I, tonight I want to pray for the people in Afghanistan and other people who are having the, those kind of problems. I mean, I don't even know what they are because I live in America. You know, I, I was lucky enough to be born here in America for no reason of my own. I could have been born over there or anywhere in a third world country and starved to death or be starving now or have a total different outlook and have no money and scrimp and save every day. But, 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 you know, so, so, so don't, don't think because you've got some money that, that, uh, you know, you know, God, look what I've done or people around me, look what I've done. You were basically given opportunities to earn that and you used your God given abilities in order to, uh, you know, you didn't waste them. And you use your God-given abilities that He gave to you, and that's great. Uh, but and, and you know, but but still, you know, a, a measure of your worth is, uh, you know, is certainly not what you've accumulated in physical means, because you're going to leave all that behind. The only thing that's going to matter is your relationship with Christ and how you and how you bore fruit to help people around you and to make a difference in the people's lives that you come in contact. Now that's that's what we mean here by the vine and the branches. And then God says, and if you are bearing this fruit and you're doing what I want you to do, then you are powerful prayer warriors. You can do whatever, uh, you know, you can bring power into people's lives that you may not even know, you may not even realize it or experience it. People who, you know, who were, um, you know, alcoholics or drug dependents, you know, that you've totally given up on and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit touches their life and changes their life and they snap out of it. I mean, that's that that doesn't happen often. But but th those are some things that we know that God can do to help us along. Um, and so it is when we go back to this and we look at at uh, the Bible studies here and we see the, the vines. It's one of my favorite ones because uh, it, it just really, I can just see Jesus standing there and talking about the vine and talking about the branches and pointing to it. And we've seen grape vines. My neighbor used to raise grapes and I know exactly what they look like. And she used to prune them, you know, just like everybody else did. And so it, it really allows me to, uh, you know, kind of an insider's look to somebody who's actually seen things like this happen in, in real life to a, to a vine. And it's, it's easy to make a comparison between that and to God. And, and then to look at that vine and say, you know, uh, God has given me a message. He's talking to me. You know, he's showing me what I should be doing. I need to bear fruit. You know, all Christians need to bear fruit. And fruit are those who, who you talk to and they become Christians. And it's fruit that you bear in your, your own life of, of, of peace and patience and, and honesty and, you know, having good character and things that draw people to Jesus Christ because of the way you live and they know you're a Christian. And so... You know, to me, like I say, those are some of the 
the most powerful verses in, in the scriptures, and I, uh, you know, have always uh, held those up in high esteem. Uh, well, we're out of time. Thank you for checking in with us today, and I hope that all of you uh, are doing well through the uh, COVID situation. I hope that you, um, you know, are you know, do, doing pretty well and, and you're not getting too bogged down without being able to get out. Uh, but just, just, you know, here, here again, um, just, just pray that the Lord's going to lead you through it and he'll give you the insights that you need to know to make a difference. So let, let's close in a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you for loving us and for caring about us. And we, we thank you, Father, that uh, with your power in our lives that we can't go wrong. And again, we pray you, we would use it and we would bear fruit and we would be an example to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.